Traditionally, they've always been thought of as five primary senses. There's vision, touch, smell, taste, and hearing. And being taught from a very young age, almost everybody is very familiar with them. And you're very familiar with describing how things feel and how they smell and look and taste and so on. However, there's far more going on in our sensory world than just those main five. So in this video, uh, what I'm going to do is do an extensive review of all of the known human senses, as well as some non-human senses, uh, animal senses that is, to contrast. So, what are senses? Well, we can more formally define them as a faculty by which the body perceives an external stimulus. Senses basically exist as a means of measuring and comparing changes that happen in our external environments. This can be a bit confusing because there's things that, you know, we sense in the loose sense of the word, um, you know, things like time or social awkwardness or what some people like to call intuition. Uh, here we're going to strictly limit our discussion uh, to the senses that are physiologically defined systems uh, that detect physical change in your external reality. So for example, you know, vision is involved in detecting photon changes, smell is involved in detecting airborne chemical changes, touch is involved in detecting atomic changes in matter, and so on. So the sensation of a particular thing implies, well, two things. Uh, that some aspect of the external physical universe exists, which are fairly well described in things like uh, you know, physics and chemistry, and the second is that change constantly occurs. After all, the world is always moving, and if nothing ever moved or changed, then none of the sensory systems would ever end up being activated because there wouldn't be anything to pick up. In the human neurobiological system, the integration and perception of sensory data is going to have a few fundamental pieces. The first is a means of detecting physical change. This takes the form of some kind of you know, special receptor molecule that is located on a nerve cell. The second is an ascending neural input from where the receptors are located into the central nervous system. So for example, you'll have receptors on your fingertips uh, that something will activate them and the neural signal, signal that's created uh, will then ascend or move up into the brain. So there's a pathway involved. And the third is a neural architecture for organizing and making sense of all this data or input. And one common way of doing this, as we'll talk about throughout this video, uh, is usually in the form of maps in the cortex. Now finally, uh, one more important thing to add before we start is that you could spend an entire you know, university lecture covering each one of the senses in depth. And there are entire courses on the senses that you can take. So because of limited time, we're just going to stick to neuroanatomy and simple function. So the purpose of this video is just to briefly outline and list each of the senses in some moderate detail. Uh, not to give you know, a full review of how they all work and everything involved. So if you're interested in what a specific brain region does or how a signal gets changed throughout the brain, then you can check out the links that I have down below. So let's get started. Vision is by far the most easily identifiable sense because in humans it happens to be the most important sense that we use to move around the world. Vision starts, obviously, in the eyes. The retina is a layer of specialized cells along the back of the eye. At the very back, there are two types of photoreceptors uh, called because of their respective shapes, rods and cones. Roughly speaking, cones code for color and rods for non-color low light. How do these cells manage to transform light energy into electrochemical energy used in neurons? Well, inside photoreceptor cells are light-sensitive proteins called opsins. These are protein complexes that are attached to the cell membranes of cells in the eye, and they contain a chromophore, or a molecule responsible for color, called 11-cis-retinol. What happens during phototransduction is that a photon of light from the outside world enters the eye, hits 11-cis-retinol, and changes its molecular shape to something called all-trans-retinol. Without going into too much detail about the molecular biology, this change in opsin shape results in a cascade of events inside the cell that eventually lead it to become activated. Cones, on the other hand, do something very similar, but in a wavelength-specific way. That is to say, the structural change will only happen when light of a certain wavelength hits the chromophore, resulting in a color-specific neural signal. <laughs> 
So, from here, the signal will move along these other cells that make up the retina in complex ways that add to visual acuity and begin to form patterns to organize the light signals. From this sheet of cells, all the nerve fibers collectively bundle together to form what is called the optic nerve, which, when moves back through the retina itself and into the brain, creates a blind spot in your vision, which you can't see unless you take advantage of some fun optical illusion tests. Now, where does the optic nerve go? Well, 90% of it goes to areas that ultimately are responsible for vision, and the other 10% go to areas involved in eye movements in the superior colliculus, and the production of circadian rhythms in the hypothalamus, which I have a whole other video on, which uh, I'll link for right here. But most of the information will end up at the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm is a splitting off of signals into different directions. Think of a freeway that has multiple exits all leading to different parts of the city. Here we see an image where what you see in your field of vision corresponds to where those signals ultimately end up in the cortex in the back of the brain. From the chiasm, information moves along what is now called the optic tract. Uh, it'll get sent to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is in the thalamus, a very interesting and complex structure which can roughly be thought of as a relay system mediating sensory inputs to various other parts of the brain, and we'll talk about that a whole bunch of times throughout the rest of this video. The uh, LGN, as it's usually shortened to, uh, organizes visual information further and through a series of projection fibers called the optic radiation, so-called because of its shape, gets spread out through an appropriately called visual cortex. And we can see here a final model of this complete pathway. Now here's where things get pretty interesting. Uh, because of the importance of vision in the human experience, the structure and organization of the visual cortex is pretty well documented. The visual cortex is located in the backmost region of the brain in a large chunk of cortex called the occipital lobe. The part of the visual cortex that receives information from the thalamus, uh, the LGN, is called V1, or sometimes striate cortex, meaning striped. And it's called this because of an interesting phenomena of organization that occurs. Areas of the visual cortex are divided up depending on where their input comes from, into columns of function. What this means is that clusters of neurons that take the shapes, the physical shape of columns will all process a distinct type of information coming from different places. So these can be things like light versus no light, or the orientation of lines, and are further divided up into which eye the information comes from. So, if you'll excuse my poor animation skills, uh, imagine that the dark blue is cortex representing the right eye and the light blue the left eye and that small chunks of this light or dark blue will process different orientations of lines that you see in your visual field and it might not seem like much but you know this is the beginning of what ultimately leads to complex object recognition now this is just you know a simulation of what it looks like but uh, when we take into consideration things like orientation which eye creates the input color and the organization of various vision related molecular activity throughout the cortex we get something a little bit more like this so there's clearly some kind of organization going on but it's not entirely clear how everything corresponds to everything else the brain is a complicated place after all the sensation of hearing is called audition and it takes a similar path that vision takes but it starts you know in the ear obviously so unlike vision that transforms photons, hearing is based on the movement of air particles in sound waves. When objects move around in the world, they move particles in the air around. And these waves of moving particles eventually reach our ears and through a very you know, delicate and kind of strange and fascinating process, produce sound sensations in our heads. Here we see the anatomy of the inner ear. Now the particle waves don't hit any sensory cells directly. Instead, they hit the tympanic membrane popularly called the eardrum. Attached to the eardrum are three bones that are themselves attached to an even smaller membrane called the oval window. These membranes and bones essentially transform a widely distributed low pressure sound waves that hit the first membrane into high pressure waves at the oval window. The oval window is attached to a fluid filled canal called the cochlea and inside the cochlea is where all the sound magic happens. Inside the cochlea is a ribbon of tissue called the organ of corti. And along this organ are tiny cells called hair cells. When sound moves the oval window, it also moves something called the tectoral membrane, which hovers just above the hair cells. Basically, a sound moves the membranes, the membranes push against the hair cells, and the hair cells transform this physical movement into neural signals via mechanically gated 
ion channels. And here we can see a model of how that might look like. Now this is a model of a you know, totally different cellular system, but the principle of a mechanically gated channel is fundamentally the same. Membranes moved by sound waves physically jar open ion channels of the hair cells, causing ions to flow between the intra and extra cellular spaces, leading to activation of the cell, and a sound signal being sent to the brain. So how does the brain make sense of different sounds? Well, different wavelengths of sound move the membranes differently, and so different parts of the organ of cordae will be activated, sending different types of signals to the brain. So a low sound might activate this, whereas a high sound might activate this. From this picture, we see that just like the retina, all the fibers from hair cells from the organ of cordae collectively bundle together to form the cochlear nerve fiber. There was a long list uh, of brain regions in between the ear and the cortex where auditory information takes its kind of final form. So I'm going to you know, somewhat rapidly list them off and give you a very brief description of their respective functions. So after leaving the cochlea, auditory information first goes to the cochlear nucleus. This is located in the brain stem, or the lower half of the brain, and basically integrates and organizes this information. This type of sound goes here, that type of sound goes there, and signals get sent along multiple pathways depending on what they represent. The next is the trapezoid body, and the superior olivary complex. The trapezoid body is the point in which nerve fibers from each side of the body switch over to the opposite side. So sound from the left ear goes to the right vein, and from the right ear, the opposite. And so is thought to have an important role in sound localization, or where sounds come from in your environment. To your left, in front of you, behind you, or so on. The olivary complex is also proposed to be involved in sound localization by comparing the time intervals between the left and right ear. Basically, if a sound comes from your left, it'll hit your left ear before it hits your right ear, and there will be a short delay in when those signals are produced by each ear. Your brain, specifically the olivary complex, will compare those two signals to determine where a sound comes from. Information will then go to the inferior colliculus, then to the medial geniculate nucleus, which contrasts with the lateral geniculate nucleus of the visual pathway. These brain regions do similar things with auditory information that they do with visual information. After this, they'll finally end up in primary auditory cortex. Like many other sensory areas in the cortex, primary auditory cortex, or A1, as it's sometimes called, is mapped, specifically a tonotopic map, or a map of tones. This means that different frequencies of sounds go to different areas in A1. So areas over here will respond to one frequency, and areas over here to a different frequency, and so on. If auditory cortex is damaged, the ability to perceive sound disappears. Further processing by areas like the middle temporal gyrus, seen here, and areas of the frontal lobe, seen here, become important for understanding speech and music. Taste, also called gustation, is a chemical sense located on the tongue. The sensory world of taste comprises of four main flavors, and sweet, sour, bitter, and salty, although there's a whole bunch of other ones that end up, end up getting classified and proposed, like umami, uh, metallic, fattiness, calcium, and pungent, you know, just to name a few. The sensory receptor of taste is the taste bud. There are thousands of buds on the tongue, and each bud contains thousands of receptors. Now, the fundamental transformation that occurs in taste is chemical. However, because different foods are made of different things, different mechanisms are needed to sense the different tastes. There's a reason why bitter and sweet taste different, and that's because bitter and sweet foods are chemically different. So here's a brief overview. I hope this is big enough for you guys to see, but the point to take away from this really is that different tastes activate different cellular mechanisms resulting in their different sensations. So in the sweet diagram, the bright pink sugar molecule binds to a receptor on the cell membrane. Uh, the orange and green represent molecular processes that ultimately end up activating uh, what here is labeled 4 and 5, which is the flow of ions into the cell, and ultimately leads to neurotransmitter release at number 7. Salty, sour, and bitter are essentially just different variants of the same process relying on different molecules. Now how exactly these receptors are distributed is up for debate. Here's an excellent image published by uh, Jairam 
Chen Drashikar in the, uh, the neuroscience journal called Nature in 2006. We can see several different models of how taste might be organized as either separate receptor cells on a single bud, or that each receptor cell has the capability of sensing each taste, or that overlapping taste information comes from each receptor. What actually happens is well beyond the scope of what we'll talk about here right now. So, nerve fibers exit the bottom of the taste buds and collectively bundle together into three of the 12 cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are ascending nerve fibers that center around the head and relay information back and forth from the head and the brain. So things like, you know, moving your eyes and mouth and the head and, and hearing and, of course, taste. Information from the tongue goes up the facial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and the vagus nerve. All three of the nerves will end up sending taste signals to a brain area called the nucleus of the solitary tract. This is found in the brainstem. From here, signals distribute out to an area of the thalamus called the ventral posterior medial nucleus. Unfortunately for us, neuroanatomy tends to be either very geographically literal and kind of boring, like the, the ventral posterior medial nucleus, or really stupid, like the mammillary bodies, or, and this isn't a joke, the nucleus ambiguous. The ventral posterior medial nucleus projects to several cortical areas like the insula, uh, also called the insular taste cortex, which we can see here. And the frontal operculum, which we see here. These areas then project to the amygdala and hippocampus, uh, seen here, where memories of tastes and their associations, like what foods they come from, are formed. Recent work has shown that there may in fact be a gustatory map in the insular cortex in which certain areas represent certain tastes, but this map has yet to be well defined. Olfaction is the sense of smell, and it's closely related to and influences the sense of taste. Smell originates, obviously, in the nose, and the basis for sense is chemical. Uh, the chemicals that are detected are referred to as odorants, and they are airborne molecules that come off of objects in the world. Uh, and here we see uh, the odorants page on Wikipedia, and we'll scroll through it, uh, and we can see some common uh, odorant chemical structures and what they look like. The odorants enter the nose, dissolve into the mucous membrane, and match up with olfactory receptors. receptors. Now, in a very similar way that tastes work, the odorant molecules bind to receptor proteins on the cells themselves, leading to a series of electrochemical changes that result in that cell sending a signal up into the brain. An interesting fact about smell is the sheer amount of olfactory receptors there are. In vision, there's rods and cones. In hearing, there's hair cells. In taste, there's basically four or five different tastes going on. But in smell, um, it's estimated that the human genome contains 400 genes coding for all olfactory receptors. There are, after all, thousands of different molecules floating in the air, and you can probably identify yourself hundreds of different smells just from memory. Where do these receptor cells in the nose send their signals to once they've been activated by odorants in the air? Well, they go to the olfactory bulb, which is, uh, you know, shaped like a bulb. Uh, and it's located in the forebrain, or the front of the brain. It is the primary brain region responsible for olfactory information. It has many different you know, cell types and cell layers with a very complex organization and connections between all of these cell layers. The first layer of processing is composed of glomeruli, um, which are these you know, kind of blob-looking things that receive signals from thousands of receptor cells and can be thought of as the structures of olfactory discrimination. Different clusters of glomeruli are associated with different smells and so on, so in a way, uh, form an organized olfactory map inside the olfactory bulb. As these signals from the glomeruli move through the other cell layers, getting further processed, the signal leaves the last layer, or the mitral cell layer, and heads directly to the olfactory cortex, skipping the thalamus, as well as a slew of other areas. Now, um, as well as this direct pathway, there's also something called the transthalamic pathway that goes 
from the medio dorsal thalamic nucleus to the orbital frontal cortex and the insular cortex, but it's very limited in size and is uh, very small compared to the main projection that goes straight from the bulb to the cortex. The projection from the olfactory bulb is called the olfactory tract, and its main target is a piece of cortex called piriform cortex, but is often just referred to as the olfactory cortex. And it's going to act as the smell version of V1 for vision or A1 for hearing. It's the primary cortical region involved uh, in the organization and conscious perception of smell. In addition to this, signals are also sent to the entorhinal cortex, which feed into the hippocampus, a brain region critical for episodic memory. The olfactory bulb also has many projections to the amygdala, a brain region important for emotional memory. And the link between smell and memory is strong, as you know, you remember foods, people, events, and places that go with smells, like feedlots and bananas and perfumes and certain people that smell bad, and you can recognize these things just from the smell alone. Now the sense of touch is distributed throughout the entire surface area of your skin. And there's four main types of receptors that detect changes in physical matter. And they lie just underneath the top layer of your skin. They're called mechanoreceptors, and they work in a very similar way that the hair cells in the inner ear, inner ear work. That is to say, physical displacement of various parts of the cell result in the flow of ions and the production of action potentials and neural signals. Each receptor is designed in a slightly different way, and so different types of stimuli produce effects in each of them, resulting in different types of sensation. These are Merkel nerve endings. They're located in the basal epidermis, as well as in hair follicles. They detect low vibrations around 5 to 15 hertz, and they're also really good for picking up stimuli from shapes and edges. There's Meisner's corpuscles, and they react to a slightly higher vibration, 10 to 50 hertz, and light touch and they're good at detecting motion on the skin. There's uh, Pacinian or Pacinian corpuscles, and they're located uh, much deeper in the tissue, and they can distinguish between rough and soft substances as well as other vibrations. And lastly, there's Raffini corpuscles, and these are receptors that react to very slow, uh, though they react very slowly to stimuli, and so they're useful for uh, feeling the movement of objects and stretches of the skin. Now because these receptors are located across the entire surface of the body, the signals that get sent get sent in a very organized way. Here's a picture of something called a dermatome. Basically what you're looking at is uh, which pieces of the spine receive information from across the body. So for example, sensory information from the skin of the thumbs goes to the dorsal root ganglia 5 and 6 of the cervical spinal section. Now the pathway from skin to brain follows a pretty strict pattern, and it goes something like this. There's the trigeminothalamic pathway, which is for sensory information coming from uh, the face, and the lemniscal pathway, which is information from the rest of the body. The first neuron sends a signal from the skin to the spinal cord. The cell body of this neuron is located just outside the spinal cord in what is called a dorsal root ganglion, or a cluster of, of several cell bodies. Uh, this signal gets sent to the opposite side of the spinal cord, uh, which it came from, and moves up large tracts of nerve fibers called dorsal columns. Now, this is a single neuron that moves this signal, meaning that there are nerve fibers several feet long that connect your toes to your spinal cord. And there are several nuclei in the column, the dorsal columns that is, uh, that these nerve fibers connect with, such as the cuneate nucleus and the gracile nucleus, covering the upper and lower half halves of the body's respectively. Signals from these nuclei go to the thalamus, which we're familiar with, uh, to a specific part called the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. The trigeminal pathway is very similar to this, uh, but it's much shorter because the face is, you know, way closer to the brain than the body. Instead of root ganglion, cell body clusters are called uh, trigeminal ganglia, and instead of the gracile and cuneate nucleus, it's the trigeminal complex. And instead of the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, it's the ventral posterior medial nucleus. So after the thalamus, this information goes to, as we can probably assume by now, primary sensory cortex, usually also called S1, and it's located in the post-central cortex, called so because it lies just behind or post the central fissure, or this long crease that you see here along the middle of the brain.
Now, just like each piece, each piece of the spinal cord receives signals from different parts of the body, the, somatory sensor, the somatosensory cortex does the exact same. Some parts are responsible for hands, others for the stomach, and so on. Sensitivity is not evenly distributed across the skin, and some areas are more sensitive than others, and areas that are more sensitive have more densely packed uh, sensory receptors on them, which means that they also have more cortical area dedicated to processing that location-specific sensitivity, and hence the existence of this really creepy-looking guy called the homunculus, or an anthropomorphized version of what the human body would look like if the body parts were represented respective to the receptor density and cortical representations. Large parts of the sensory cortex are devoted to hand information because your hands are very touch sensitive. So from the, uh, the sensory cortex, signals are sent to a wide variety of other cortical areas, uh, also the hippocampus and the amygdala, as well as descending projections back down to the thalamus and the brainstem. As an interesting aside, there also exists a special type of sensation called social touch. Now it's one thing to, you know, stick your hand out and, and touch a physical object. It's an entirely different thing to touch skin from another person. And anyone who's ever, you know, hugged their mom knows that it different, feels different from hugging a tree. Or anyone who's ever, you know, kissed their partner knows that it feels way different from kissing glass. When touching another person, the same pathway of cortex um, from normal touch is activated. However, on top of this, the anterior cingulate cortex, seen here, as well as the insula, and the orbital frontal cortex, seen here, are also active. This may be the case because these regions uh, are heavily involved in things like emotion and social cognition, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, they also process information about pain. So that covers the big five, taste, smell, vision, hearing, and touch, but like I said at the beginning of the video, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, now, because we covered touch last, I'm going to discuss the other senses that are associated with touch, but a little bit different. They originate in the same place, the skin, they move up relatively the same pathways, but they represent different types of information. The first is nociception, which is pain, and the second is thermoception, which is about temperature. ...is the sensation of cellular damage on your body, and it's perceived as pain. And it can happen in a number of different ways. You can damage the cell physically, chemically, or you can you know, do it with temperature. Now, pain is a bit tricky because there's lots of ways of describing pain. Uh, a lot like you know, physical injury, upset stomach, emotional pain, and it can get a bit confusing. But for the sake of this conversation, uh, we're going to limit it to um, you know, just physical pain in the outer layer of your skin, like cell damage. Nociceptors aren't specialized cell types. Uh, but are simply open-ended nerve fibers. And pain isn't actually a, you know, an overload of a particular signal like people might think. You know, bright lights, bright lights don't hurt because it's too much light. It hurts because they activate special nociceptors. Uh, now, there are several types of ways to produce pain, and so several distinct cellular mechanisms uh, exist to detect them. So there's physical damage that will activate mechanosensitive nociceptors, heat, will activate thermosensitive nociceptors, and there are more general polymodal nociceptors that respond to a whole bunch of different uh, types of stimuli. How exactly the signal gets created will depend on the type of damage, but the overall result is pretty much the same. Located on the membrane of any one open nerve fiber are many receptor types that respond to different signals. Um, to keep it simple, there are transient receptor potential channels as well as valinoid receptors, and they respond to excessive heat. They have a specialized structure that moves open only when a certain temperature is reached, in the same way that a voltage-gated channel will only open when an electrical current passes through it. These same channels also have a binding site attached to them for chemical compounds called valinoids. Caspicin, or the thing that makes peppers really spicy, is a valinoid, and so offers a potential mechanism for sensing painful chemical stimuli. Tissue damage results in the malformation of cells in the skin. The exact mechanism behind mechanical pain sensation isn't well known, but we can imagine that it would be very similar to the way that touch works, by physically moving or jarring open receptors and channels, leading to an open flow of chemicals in and out of the cell.
Some proposed mechanisms for mechanical pain detection are the degenerin epithelial sodium channel, acid sensing channel, um, also called, well, that, you can read that there, uh, TRP channels like TRPA1 and TRPV4, and things called piezo channels. There are many different subtypes of TRP channels, and it has been found that some of the chemicals that result in skin damage, like acids, bind to some of these channel subtypes, opening them. But given the number of subtypes and the number of potentially damaging compounds, this knowledge base is still very minimal. The pain pathways are very similar to, but different in their own right, from the touch pathways. The neurons that have open nerve fibers on them originate in the dorsal root ganglia. There are two types of pain nerve fibers. One is the A-delta fiber, which is a fast pain produced by the stimulus itself, and the other is called a C-fiber, which is a slow, longer-lasting pain even when the stimulus has gone away. In this way, things hurt immediately, but they also hurt for a while. These signals move up the spinal cord, cross sides in what is called a decussation. Left goes right and right goes left, like we've covered before in all the other senses, and then forms what is called the anterolateral system, and it branches off into a whole bunch of interesting directions for a whole bunch of interesting reasons. Now, as you can imagine, pain is a very evolutionarily old system. You know, the subjective nature of pain perception might be up for debate, but what isn't up for the debate is the ability to detect, to detect damaging stimuli. So part of the ascending pain signals get sent to the brainstem and the hypothalamus to activate the organism for immediate movement, produce fear and anxiety, and the fight or flight response. And so these are brain areas like the reticular formation, the superior colliculus, the periaqueductal gray, and the hypothalamus. Another part of the pain pathway in this anterolateral system goes to the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus and then to the somatosensory cortex, just like touch sensation we talked about before. And it's thought to be involved in the discrimination between types of and intensities of different pain. A second cortical pathway is much more emotional. After reaching the thalamus, these signals go to the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex. Proposed functions of the insula in relation to pain is making expectation judgments of intensity of pain. That is to say, you will think, how much will this hurt if I do it? Whereas the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in pain affect, or the emotional awareness of being in pain. Uh, not regulating the intensity of the pain signal itself, but how you feel about the pain signal. How bad the pain makes you feel. And both of these regions, the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, are heavily implicated in empathy, self-awareness, and emotion. The perception of temperature is something that you can do independently of touch. You know, just place a, a hot thing near your skin without actually touching your skin, and you'll know exactly what I mean. This is going to be a pretty short section on, on thermoception because pretty much everything we just talked about with pain is relevant to temperature as well. You know, free nerve endings with um, uh, TRP channels send information about temperature up the anterolateral system. These signals, these signals end up going to many of the same places we just talked about, like the hypothalamus, which is involved in thermal regulation of the body. Um, in a sense, temperature sensation is just a, a not harmful version of heat damage. So similarly, temperature activates the insula as well. So not too much there. Other potential senses of interest are the internal senses. Everything we've been talking about is about picking up information from the outside world, which collectively you can kind of call a exteroception. Well, there's a whole nother class of, of systems and receptors involved for things happening inside your body, and that's called interoception. Um, with the exception of a couple that we'll talk about, as well as hunger, uh, almost all of these are automatic, self-regulating systems that are part of the unconscious autonomic nervous system. So examples of these might be pulmonary stretch receptors that regulate lung capacity and breathing, chemoreceptors in the brain that measure CO2 and oxygen levels, uh, there's chemoreceptors that detect salt levels uh, in your blood, in your body, to uh, maintain osmotic regulation, there's receptors in, uh, in your bladder and stomach that can indicate when the organs are full, um, but I'm not going to go over any of those in significant detail because they're not usually considered part of sensory systems but part of the auto autonomic nervous system and critical in the regulation of bodily processes instead of collecting data about the world around you. However, there's two systems that regularly get lumped in with all the um, sensory 
uh, systems involved in exteroception, and they regulate balance. So the first is proprioception, and the second is equilibrioception. Proprioception is the sense of where your limbs are in space. There's uh, special mechanoreceptors in the muscles of the body that provide this information. Um, the, fir the first are called Golgi tendon organs, and they convey information about mus muscle tension to the brain. When the muscle contracts, this changes the shape of the fibers inside the organ, stretching open ion channels in the nerve cells that innervate the organ. The muscle spindles, on the other hand, operate on a very similar basis, with the length of the muscle determining how stretched open a channel is, and therefore how much neural signal is coming from the spindle. The signal from these receptors move along their own class of nerve fibers referred to as 1A and 1B afferents. They enter the spine through the dorsal root ganglia. Uh, some go back out into the body to mediate reflexes, whereas some go up directly into the brain, mostly the cerebellum for the control of motor reflexes, to the thalamus that ultimately leads to the somatic sensory cortex just like touch. Balance is regulated by something called the vestibular system. These are a series of fluid-filled canals in the ear, as well as two organs called otolith organs, the saccule and the utricle. The canals provide information about rotational acceleration of the head, and the otolith organs about linear acceleration and head position. And how they work is, uh, is actually quite strange. Now, just like hair cells in the ear dedicated to sound, hair cells exist in the vestibular organs and function pretty much exactly in the same way, being physically displaced, resulting in opening ion channels uh, into the cells. First, we'll cover the organs. The saccule and the utricle are two fluid-filled chambers with hair cells lining the insides of them. Suspended in the fluid, are calcium carbonate crystals called autoconia. The crystals move within the motion, move with the motion of the head in relation to gravity, hitting the hair cells and moving them to produce neural signals. You can basically think of like a snow globe, which when you turn it on its side, all the little snow bits fall onto one side of the wall. Well, that wall will be covered with receptors and it'll tell your brain that you're lying on your side. But what this can't tell you is if you're spinning in a circle, and that's where the canals come in. The canals have membranes inside them with hair cells that are inside the membranes. When your head spins rotationally, the fluid in the canals pushes against the membranes. Movement of the membrane moves the hair cells, and you can, you can figure it out from there. Signals get sent to the brain. Signals from the canals and organs get sent to the brain via uh, the cranial nerve 8, called the vestibular nerve. This goes to the vestibular nuclei, a collection of cell clusters located in the brainstem. Now the vestibular nuclei integrates information important to balance, like visual and sensory motor information as well. From here, signals about balance go to three general places. One is other brainstem and lower brain regions in the spine, areas involved in reflexive balance. The second is the cerebellum, this large chunk of brain in the back coordinating movement, and the third is the thalamus that relays information to somatosensory cortex and motor cortex to influence the production of movements. There are many other you know, senses um, that are proposed to exist in humans, uh, and we have some pretty basic knowledge about their neural correlates, but because they aren't really set up anatomically like the other ones we've just talked about, they don't really count, and that would be things like you know, time. You have a, a general sense of time and, and how long time lasts for, but there's no time receptors. Um, there's no, there's nothing that kind of measures time as it passes by. Um, another good example is pheromones, uh, in a brain region called the vemoronasal organ, which detects pheromones. Now pheromones are definitely real, you know, and they happen in all sorts of animal species, but their use in humans is, you know, highly debated, and it's often referred to as a you know, kind of vestigial sense that doesn't really work anymore. So that might be a topic for a whole nother video. Now finally, because I know this, this is pretty long already. There are many senses that exist in non-human animals that don't exist in humans. These are things like, things like echolocation in bats, using you know sound to kind of see where you're going. Interestingly enough, you can actually train blind people to use echolocation to navigate throughout the world. Um, there's electroreception, which is the ability to sense electrical charges, so electric eels would be a good example of this.
There's magnetoreception, which is the sense of magnetic waves in the environment. So you've got you know the two top and bottom poles on uh, or the north and south pole on the top and bottom of the planet, and uh, they create magnetic waves around the Earth, and and some animals can pick up on that to kind of give them an innate sense of cardinal direction to help them navigate through the world. There's high grow, not hydro, but high grow reception, which is uh, an ability in insects to detect changes in moisture levels. Um, and some animals have um, senses of vision that go way beyond the visible light spectrum that we usually think of for, uh, for humans. So for, for example, some snakes have these organs in the front of their faces called infrared pits that allow them to, uh, I guess, see if that's what you want to call it, in infrared. Kind of like the movie Predator, you know? And there's probably countless other examples that we have yet to discover. So, inclusion, there are many senses beyond the big five in the human repertoire and probably even more outside of that that we have yet to discover in other animals. So, here's a nice uh, infographic to recap on all the information that we've covered in this video. Now, importantly, all of the information that I've covered here is not mine. I do not have the time or the money to run hundreds of experiments. Uh, all that I've done today is uh, show you the results of hard work from neuroscientists over the years. This is simply my presentation. So if you're interested in learning more, then please check out the links and references that I've got in the low bar. And as always, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.